Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to adjust our screen a little bit here, too. I uh, hope everybody can see the screen and uh, see us. Uh, my right-hand woman is here just on my right, and uh, we're delighted to be here with you. Um, and I also want to thank John Dwyer for uh, hosting tonight and for the expertise that uh, makes this possible. So it's uh, very important. And um, you can see that we were in Cambodia in 2019, uh, February 24th to March 9th. Uh, it was a trip sponsored by the uh, Victor Emanuel Nature Tours. Uh, what you're looking at too is the flag of the country of Cambodia. Um, and at the center of the flag is a, a drawing of the kind of uh, iconic uh, temples of Angkor Wat, or at least the, the view of the front of, of some of the temples that, that uh, is, uh, you know, it shows up in all the postcards and so on. And so one of the reasons that we chose Cambodia is that we uh, wanted to see the temples of Angkor Wat, one of the wonders of the ancient world, uh, as well as the, the birds and the other aspects of the, of the country. So, uh, thus uh, Cambodia, as opposed to some other Southeast Asian countries we could have chosen. And here's our group. Um, the gentleman on the left, Nara, is our Cambodian guide, and the gentleman next to him, the Dion Hobcroft, is a uh, uh, tour leader for Victor Emanuel Nature Tours. And as you can see, we were a small group of seven participants. Uh, you can see six of us, and Chris, of course, is taking the picture, uh, so she's not in this one. And uh, virtually every photograph you'll see, save one, uh, was taken by Chris, and I took one with her in it just to prove she was there. So a little bit about Cambodia, first of all. Um, as you can see, it is bordered on the north and west by Thailand, to the north by Laos, to the east by Vietnam. So it's a Southeast Asian country that is uh, not very large by U.S. standards. This, the, uh, uh, well, to give you an idea, Cambodia is almost exactly the size of the state of Oklahoma. Uh, but it has four times as many people as Oklahoma, so it's a bit more crowded uh, with a population of uh, about 16.7 million people. And one out of every eight Cambodians lives here in uh, Phnom Penh, the capital city, about two and a quarter million people. Uh, the country is very flat uh, in a kind of a diagonal strip down the middle here, which is where we spend a great deal of our time. Uh, but there are mountains to the west, uh, extensive mountains to the northeast. This is a very wild area on the border with Vietnam and Laos, uh, which is an area that uh, was in the news a great deal during the Vietnam War, if you are old enough to remember that, and I certainly am, um, uh, because uh, a lot of uh, military activity was going on here. And in fact, a lot of bombs were dropped in this region. Uh, we did not go there in a, a relatively inaccessible area. Um, and, and then, of course, the Mekong River, I need to mention, is a main uh, um, body of water that flows through uh, the country to the, from north to south. It actually rises way up in eastern Tibet in the Himalayas and uh, goes on down into Vietnam where it ent uh, empties into the... Uh, the South China Sea, actually the Mekong River is the largest river in Southeast Asia and is considerably longer than the Mississippi River. Uh, there are bra branches uh, of the Mekong River, some of which flow through this area. Uh, and uh, I will mention uh, again, uh, Tonle Sap Lake, which is the largest lake in Southeast Asia. Uh, so a little bit about our route and then I'll get off this slide. Um, we flew in to Siem Reap, which is the airport um, uh, entrance to uh, Angkor Wat, the ruins which are right next to the city of Siem Reap. Uh, Siem Reap's about 140,000 people, about like Akron, Ohio in size, but it's probably twice that large at any given time uh, because there are thousands and thousands of tourists uh, visiting the temples 
uh, and the, the ruins uh, all the time. Uh, we spent a few days there. Then we went up to Tamat Bui and uh, to another area, which is actually called Ville Cruz, although that's not the name you see here. Several days in each of those places. Um, and then we took a, a bird, a, a, an excursion across the lake and um, probably three quarters of our trip was spent just doing that. But then we drove across the country and spent a few days here in the hills of um, uh, the eastern part of the country uh, where the birds are different and the climate is different. This is a very hot, dry area uh, during the season that we were there. Uh, this is a rainier area. Uh, it's hot everywhere uh, in Cambodia. Uh, that much is for sure. And this will give you an idea. This was the weather at Siem Reap um, during the week that we were there. And as you can see, no rain and hot, hot days. This is a typical street scene in Cambodia, but this picture taken in Siem Reap, but all the towns and villages and cities. Uh, you see a few motor cars, not very many, uh, but mainly people get around by motorcycle uh, or just bicycles, uh, but motorbikes are very popular and they hitch them to these two-wheel carts, uh, which serve as uh, taxis or they transport their families or they transport the groceries, whatever they happen to be carrying, uh, and uh, these are called tuk-tuks, uh, motorbikes with these carriages attached. And uh, this is the main way people get around. Uh, we weren't exactly roughing it uh, at uh, Siem Reap. We stayed uh, at the Angkor Village Resort, uh, right at the edge of the ruins, uh, people uh, who come as tourists to see the ruins have the, the choice of uh, several very, very nice accommodations. Uh, <laughs> we were upstairs on the second floor here. Uh, this is what our bathroom looks like. I think there's a rule in my wife's family that you always have to show your bathrooms when you travel. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is... Uh, I suppose it was supposed to be a swimming pool, but it, it, it had an interesting green color and uh, uh, lots of things floating by. And so- uh, that's, that's Jane who decided you know, only to go knee deep. Yeah, she, uh, this was uh, one member of our group that decided to, to try just getting knee deep there. But then you have to imagine it's about a hundred degrees. So it looks inviting, but uh, then again, thinking about uh, microorganisms and things like that. Uh, nobody goes in it. Um, this is the view from our balcony on the back of our room. We have this nice little overlook. You look down into that pool and into the tropical vegetation. The rooms were air conditioned. Um, food was good. I'll come back to the food in a little bit. And uh, so uh, this was thoroughly enjoyable and uh, for the first few nights. And here's the same view that you see on the flag of Cambodia. These three iconic towers. There are actually five towers and you can just barely see the tops there and there, uh, the two in the back. Uh, I think at this point I'll turn it over to Chris to say a little bit about uh, yeah. Angkor Wat and the uh, history of, uh, of these ruins. Uh, you can see it uh, dates from the 12th century uh, by King Suri of Armin II, who was the first built this. So, Chris? Yes, and he intended it as a Hindu temple, and he dedicated it to Vishnu, and ultimately it became his mausoleum. Um, and um, the design, which is three platforms piled on top of each other, and it, the sides of these platforms had carvings that are called bas reliefs, and um, there were all kinds of uh, sculptures of, of the different Hindu gods. And um, the, the platforms themselves were supposed to represent Mount Meru, which is in Hindu culture is where the gods live. 
Well, um, unfortunately, about 76 years after he died, um, the country was taken over by um, their uh, rivals, the Cham family, and um, they overran Angkor Wat and did a lot of things to the actual temple. But um, Jayavarman VII came along and he restored the Khmer um, reign and he installed himself as king and he sort of added to some of these vast reliefs and um, because he sort of declared himself king he didn't have the right by means of blood so some of these vast reliefs are actually showing how he uh, convinced the people that he even though he wasn't royal that he deserved being their king so um, anyways, our guide was showing us all these different stories. These are just stories. This is their, the history of their country in, in all these reliefs. And, and oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, <laughs> um, gradually after the 13th century, um, this was converted into a Buddhist temple, which means they did not believe in Hindu gods. So some of the gods which are were in little areas along the sides of the building were gouged out and you could just see where they used to be and then in modern times in the 18 i'm sorry 1980s and eight, uh, 1990s some um thailand art thieves came in and um did a lot of damage by taking the heads off nearly all of the independently standing statues and selling them off for whatever reason. So anyways, what, what you see today is still um, fantastic as far as the stories being told uh, in these vast reliefs. And just, you get some idea of the scale of this place by, by looking at this wall uh, here, where some of us are, and it just goes on for hundreds of feet. Uh, luckily, um, under portico so that the weather didn't destroy it. And, the, the theme from one end to the other is um, military uh, conquest or fighting. Uh, so you, you, know, you get the impression that all these people did was go to war, but I'm sure that's not accurate, but that's what they, that's what they carved. Uh, and you can see some of these- Those are captives there. The captives being brought back to, or whatever fate was in store for them, with, with thongs through their noses and collars on, uh, and so you, you got the impression that the, uh, life was difficult. <laughs> life was difficult. Yeah, it wouldn't, wouldn't do to uh, lose in the in battles at least if they at that time. <clears throat> the ruins are a popular site for wedding photos. And we saw this bride and her groom being photographed, and you have to picture the, <laughs> the heat and the, and the dust and. <laughs> the, the dust that was getting on her dress and all that, but uh, this was uh, uh, apparently something that happens every day there. And you can also note the, the immense trees with the typical tropical buttress roots. These are probably figs uh, that uh, are gradually, you know, taking over some of these big buildings. Uh, you can get an idea of these huge uh, Buddhas, uh, these huge carved heads, uh, if you know the size of the people down here. So this is really a remarkable site and uh, something that I'm, I'm so glad that we decided to, to go see and you know, choose Cambodia as our Southeast Asian um, destination. And at the site you do see Buddhist monks um, in their traditional garb, and uh, also, uh, birding was excellent. A very dry forest surrounding the ruins. I'm not sure where, where birds find water, but uh, at least in the dry season. Uh, but we went birding there as well as looking at the ruins. And uh, here are some of the birds that we saw. Uh, and I need to uh, also, as kind of a disclaimer of sorts, one of the things that we found very interesting uh, was that uh, the birds in Southeast Asia are very shy and much more difficult to approach and photograph than the birds in 
Central and South America, which we, we have a great deal of experience with that part of the world, uh, and Africa the same way, actually. Uh, so I don't know whether it's just a longer history of uh, being uh, uh, shot and put in a stew pot uh, for these Southeast Asian birds, uh, but they, they are not as approachable. But here are some of the birds that we saw at the, uh, at the ruins, uh, the, the Ashy Drongo, uh, one of the poorly named birds, a white throated rock thrush. There actually is a little spot of white feathers there, but uh, here's this beautiful blue and black and chestnut bird, and they call it a white throated rock thrush. So uh, all I can do is just uh, say that's what it is. Common mina, uh, which is um, kind of the uh, ecological equivalent of our European starlings. It's just a, an everywhere bird walking around on the ground and you see them uh, in Hawaii that actually where they're introduced the same way as here in Southeast Asia where they're native. Some more birds, the black capped kingfisher. Uh, Southeast Asia has a great variety of kingfishers, some very tiny ones to some very large ones. Uh, the Asian barred owlet uh, here. We don't have a lot of owl pictures, but in fact, we saw a great many owls, I think, maybe 10, 10 different species of owls or maybe more. And down on the lower right is the blue rock thrush immature. Uh, as you may know, uh, young thrushes are speckled. Uh, if you think about our young robins that start out with speckled breasts uh, and then they lose those speckles as they become adults. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, adult rock thrush is an all uh, dark blue bird that really looks nothing like this. <laughs> color-wise. Uh, we, we saw rock thrushes in um, Spain, so it's a very widespread bird across Eurasia. High in the trees are lineated barbets, a very noisy bird, but uh, you never see them down low, so it's probably about the best risk of two. Uh, a very shy bird, the forest wagtail, uh, which walks in the ground, uh, on the ground in dense undergrowth and the red-breasted parakeets, a very common <laughs> parrot throughout much of Cambodia and uh, another bird that I would have named something else, but uh, there you have it. We didn't see a lot of mammals. Um, the mammals, like the birds, are very shy, but an exception were these long-tailed macaques, type of monkey, uh, that was uh, in the forest right around the ruins, very used to people, probably getting handouts from people, the male on the left, the female and young on the right. And we're just walking down the dusty road uh, outside the ruins and these uh, macaques just came toward us and just kept right walking by us uh, as if we, we were just of no consequence whatsoever. Very interesting squirrel there. This squirrel is a reddish animal, finlacing squirrel, almost bright chestnut rufous with a white ring around the base of the tail. You can see it right there. A very unusual marking. And this was a fairly common animal. It and never stood still. <laughs> it never stood still. Well, he stood still just long enough here. <laughs> and, uh, uh, a whip scorpion, and just to convince you that yes, we are in the tropics here, uh, this animal, the body is probably about four or five inches long, just this much, so it's a, it's a big critter. Very ferocious looking. In um, Sam Reap, there's a village uh, town square with some tall shade trees and right there in the middle of the city are is a roost of uh, several dozen flying foxes. These are among the world's largest bats. These are fruit-eating bats and they uh, are quite large. The wingspan is probably at least at least three feet uh, for these so-called flying foxes and they um, that that would be sort of like a broad-winged hawk or a crow uh, sized uh, bat. So pretty impressive. 
So now we're on uh, Lake Tonle Sap, uh, the largest lake in Southeast Asia. And it, uh, I think it was the only day in the western part of Cambodia that it rained and it uh, kind of drizzled on us for quite a while. So um, there's, there's rain falling, I'm supposed in this picture. We were in two boats. Can you turn that up? Across the lake. Hi, sir. Both. I'm sorry. Somebody. So uh, people live right on the water there. Um, we saw uh, people just uh, anchor or just floating in, in, uh, in structures that are out on the lake. Uh, they just live there. Uh, in fact, this complex of structures out on the lake has a school, uh, we were told. Uh, so the families that just live on the lake and make their living uh, on fish, uh, they'll take a boat to market to buy other other things. Uh, this is sort of a typical a little family dwelling here uh, on stakes, stake, stilts up above the water. Uh, marshes, very extensive marshes that surround uh, parts of this lake. And we saw men fishing uh, these poles, which you may not be able to see well, but I'm kind of hitting them with my cursor. Uh, with some netting. Uh, so these are apparently fish traps uh, where the fish are, are trapped if they swim in there. And uh, these guys uh, with their motor boats uh, also fishing with rods. And they might spend all day out there uh, just, just gathering food for the family for that, for that evening. Yeah, one of the common activities for the people go visiting the temples was to spend an afternoon then to come out and uh, like where Elliot pointed out the um, school, part of that was also a restaurant. And, and so people would unload and literally eat lunch or dinner at the restaurant and then go back to see them reap. So it was a uh, sort of an outing, very common to do these um, aquatic restaurant venues. And also you can see cruising the lake uh, as a very popular tourist activity. The, it, it's a fuzzy slide because it's raining uh, at the time that Chris took this picture. But you can see all the national flags of the various countries that, uh, who, uh, who come and, and uh, ride on the, on the lake, the Amer American flags right there at the front. And also I was amused as Queen Tara it's the name of the uh, the name of the uh, ship in English there. Well, our main reason for cruising the lake was to get to uh, the far shore, where there was a uh, reserve for storks. <clears throat> for whatever reason, this lake is uh, kind of a, a nucleus for rare storks, and we saw six species of storks. Uh, during our day uh, there, we went to uh, to the shore where there, the vegetation was relatively low, relatively easy to walk around. I uh, had our lunch there uh, on this peninsula, and uh, there uh, we just kept watching and eventually saw six kinds of storks, of which we have four pictures. Uh, this is the lesser adjutant stork. Uh, here a very well-named uh, stork, open bill stork. So the bill is just naturally open like that. Black neck sto stork and the painted stork here flying, which you can see at a distance. Now, the two other storks are the milky snork, stork, snork, and the uh, greater adjutant stork. The greater adjutant is one of the rarest storks in the world, and the only one we saw was flying at a great distance. Uh, just barely close enough for us to identify. <coughs> but to give you an idea of how rare the greater adjutant is, this is, uh, this is the uh, total geographic range of this bird. Uh, it just nests in a small area in central Cambodia, basically where we were. And then there's a population uh, up here in um, northeastern part of India um, near Myanmar and Bangladesh and that the blue are just uh, where the storks uh, might be found in the winter time when they're not nesting. So the nesting area is pretty much here, maybe a little bit here and then 
uh, here in, in Cambodia. So um, pretty rare bird and we felt very fortunate to see one even though it was at a great distance. Other birds along the lake. Uh, traversing this lake, we had some of the uh, um, most abundant waterfowl that I've ever seen in terms of herons and kingfishers. Um, just everywhere you went, there was something flushing up out of there. Great egret, which is the same as the egret we have here. A common kingfisher, a very tiny kingfisher, only about uh, four or five inches long. Uh, that uh, is found all across Eurasia, and the gray-headed fish eagle here. And then on to Tamat Boy, uh, where the temperature was 101. And <laughs> very, yeah, at least. And here's uh, our, our domicile for several nights was, were these buildings. Uh, Kathy and Jess, our friends from Dallas, shared, uh, had that side, and Chris and I had this side. And um, it, it's just roasting out in the sun. And here's what it looked like inside. Um, there were no screens. So you had your choice of leaving these louvers open, in which case anything could fly in, uh, or closing them up, in which case it got um, incredibly hot. Uh, but we did close them up and we had two very modern air conditioners, a left air conditioner and a right air conditioner, uh, which uh, were very effective at recirculating the 101 or perhaps 110 degree air around us. Um, and you might know the mosquito netting. The bathroom uh, seen here in part uh, was uh, It was what I call a do-it-yourself bathroom. A do-it-yourself. And what she means is note that there's no tank on the toilet. In order to flush it, uh, you have this big container with a, there's a pot down in there. You run water into that uh, pot from this spigot. Notice how clean the water is. And then you dump into the toilet from that pot until whatever's there disappears. Hopefully. Yeah. The sink uh, is not visible. It's off to the left here. The sink had no plumbing. Um, I mean, where there was a sink, but no drain, uh, uh, you know, no trap or anything. And so there was a hose attached to the underside of the sink that carried the water away. And there was a hole in the floor right back there, just out of sight by the toilet, where hopefully the water from the sink would run out. And your shower. To, was, some, to some place. Yeah, the shower is to to take there, it, turn the water on, crouch, and use the little scooper from here to throw it over yourself. And the drain was on the floor where that the hole where the mold is there. <laughs> Anyways, it was um, it was it was inside. I guess if you wanted indoor plumbing, it was indoors. But all's not lost. Because we had a welcome roommate, a toke gecko, a very uh, sizable lizard, things about eight or nine inches long, uh, which we were actually delighted to see because it would feed on anything uh, smaller than itself uh, that happened to be in there. So that was just fine. It's actually a very beautiful lizard. And it sings. It, it, it gave us a chorus through the night. It was pretty cool. Most of the time, uh, it's to Matt Bowie in, in that the whole region we spent in the forest uh, or in dry fields, which I'll come to. Uh, these are dipterocarp forests. Uh, a little more about that word in a, in a bit, but it, that's the first of the family of trees that's dominant in these forests. And it, being the dry season, there was a lot of burning going on. Uh, some of it might have been natural, some of it might have been set by people. Uh, and the, the uh, forest would just uh, burn kind of slowly. The, the, the uh, embers would creep along, as you can see here. The embers are just creeping along through the litter. Uh, every so often they would catch uh, a spot where there was more fuel and the and flames would flare up a foot or two. And then after that patch was burned, 
uh, it would just recede and but but continue on slowly across the uh, across the landscape, burning off the litter. And uh, there was a lot of this just going on around us as we walked around. Uh, some of it had been burned at a, uh, hotter, uh, and uh, we so we did as you can see on the right uh, find some patches that were uh, burned with a hotter flame and had uh, singed off the foliage of a lot of the trees. But this is a, a definitely a fire adapted. Uh, ecosystem. The dipterocarp, uh, his family dipterocarpaceae, is a, a dominant tree family in the Southeast Asia and it is so named uh, because uh, of the structure of the seeds. Uh, die means two, uh, P-T-E-R has to do with wings and carp are seeds. So they are two winged seeds, dipterocarp, and you can see that here. Well, the other uh, ecosystem that we spent a lot of time in, aside from the forest, was uh, rice fields that were at, at rest, that had been harvested uh, at the end of the rainy season, and uh, now we're just sitting. And uh, as you can see, we hiked some very long distances across these fields in search of birds. And uh, it was very hot, uh, very important to have headgear and protect your head and uh, drink a lot of water and avoid sunburn too. Uh, it may be a little counterintuitive to be wearing long sleeves and long pants at 100 degrees, uh, but very important to do that uh, for sun protection. And it's very surprising, the diversity of birds, particularly in the forest. So here are some of them. Uh, black crested bulbul, black headed woodpecker, black colored starling, same family as our European starling that we have, Changeable hawk eagle at a mass, the um, chestnut headed bee eater, collared Scots owl, yet another owl. Uh, and again, the, this is just a scratching the surface of the uh, variety of birds that we saw, particularly woodpeckers. This area had a surprising variety of uh, really neat woodpeckers, ranging from very small ones the size of our downy woodpeckers. This one, which you see in the middle, uh, at a great distance, unfortunately, we never got close to one. Uh, but the great slaty woodpecker is one of the largest woodpeckers in the world, measuring about 20 or 21 inches from beak to tail. And uh, a crow is about 17 inches, so that gives you an idea that this is a, this is a big bird. Uh, this was one of the more fascinating birds we saw on the left, the crested tree swift. Look at, the, uh, look at the wings and the tail. So when this thing flies, it, it looks like a flying boomerang. It's really remarkable and incredibly fast. And then among the very beautiful small birds that we saw, the, the uh, small minivet. This is about a five or six inch long bird, about the size of a sparrow. The male is this brilliantly colored guy. The female's here uh, <laughs> until we I <laughs> blew this slide up and looked at it. I didn't even realize the female was there. A few more birds. Large wood shrike. This is a big. Uh, oh, unmuted. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, this is a very large uh, shrike type bird that feeds on large insects. The stork billed kingfisher. Uh, a, uh, a very large kingfisher with a very large bill, and the white rumped falcon. Um, all predatory birds are uh, eating one thing or another. I suspect this white rumped falcon is eating a lot of small birds, probably. One of the special things that we did in this region uh, was look for a couple of extremely rare ibises. Uh, and this gentleman, whose name we don't know, but we just called him Commander Ibis, <laughs> and he was a, 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 a ranger in charge of uh, protecting these ibises and leading people through the forest to see them. And as I mentioned here, we had no idea where we were or how to find them. Like Anything happened to this guy? <laughs> well, I don't even want to go there. The, the forest all looks the same. 
the sun's straight overhead. You have no sense of direction whatsoever. He takes off through the forest and for miles. And we just follow him. At a very fast rate, at 104 degrees. <laughs> well, and so we, uh, we found these two ibises. This is the white-shouldered ibis, which would seem like a curious name, except that when the bird flies, it does show white uh, at the shoulders. It's concealed with his perch. <clears throat> but this is, to me, one of the most interesting birds of the whole trip. The one on the right is the giant ibis. Uh, we just saw this one bird sitting in a tree uh, above a small a depression in the middle of the forest, so just a vegetated depression that might have been maybe a couple hundred feet across. Notice his eye is way up in the top of his head. His body is immense. This, is, this bird, his body is about the size of a bald eagle. It is just a huge body on this bird. And so we, we were asking um, our guide, Nara, uh, what is this bird doing here? Uh, how, what does it live on? Well, it turns out that the uh, depression that we saw, sorry, we didn't take a picture of it. It's just a, a, a circular area, uh, a low area with no vegetation in it. And it, uh, it was dry, uh, but apparently when that, uh, pool fills up during the rainy season. It's full of eels. Uh, this ibis uh, specializes on eels. And in the dry season, when the pool dries up, the eels burrow into the ground, and this bird uh, can go down and, uh, with its beak, and probe around and pull them out and eat. So, all I can say is no wonder it's a rare bird. But it was a wonderful thing to see them. Now, Speaking we of, did not eat eels. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to just take a little break here, uh, change pace, and then we'll talk about the food. We're really back, uh, to, to, uh, to be honest here, we're really back at uh, uh, our uh, very comfortable lodging in, uh, in uh, Siem Reap that is made for a lot. The top and, two pictures. And the top two pictures, anyway. Yes. This is uh, a chicken on skewers. Um, with this peanut sauce called sete sauce, absolutely delicious. Uh, remember what this was, Chris? No. Don't remember what this was. It was good. It was good. <laughs> it was an unidentified meat, and that's probably maybe better that way. But uh, anyway, it, it was delicious. And then for dessert, uh, crepes with coconut ice cream. So that's. Uh, a very early high point, <laughs> but we also had uh, out in the field uh, some some very good dinner. This is this is uh, tempura battered shrimp, a nice salad, and here is uh, some uh, spare ribs, and of course note the requisite anchor beer. So um, on the whole, uh, we had some some good food. Nobody really went hungry. Uh, However, uh, I had some, I got a little tired of the soup, um, which I guess I call mystery soup up here. I think whatever was around got put in soup. And then I, I was, of course, a good sport, but here I think Chris caught me at an unguarded moment as the meal was put down. <laughs> and then we went to a market, and here in great heaps, are uh, scorpions, beetle grubs, and tarantulas for sale, and so obviously that is a part of the uh, of the Cambodian cuisine. And could have been in that soup. Who knows? Could have been. But, could have been the flavoring. <laughs> but I think pretty much we were fed the way they would expect Westerners to eat. Um, but uh, it was interesting to see all this stuff uh, that's not normally part of our cuisine here in in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, in, in great quantities uh, for sale. Most of these dried, roasted inverts. And at the market there was uh, a woman and her little boy uh, showing off for us uh, the tarantulas, which are, these are live. Notice the one on top of his head. So of course I had to hold a couple of them. Uh, but uh, these were um, 
really very harmless, uh, gentle, I don't know, is there such a thing as a gentle tarantula? Uh, at any rate, uh, I didn't feel, when I saw the, the way uh, they were holding these spiders, I didn't have any fear of doing it. Uh, but I assume that these things get roasted and uh, end up in the, in the platter with uh, everything else that uh, was nearby at the market. The uh, main export uh, of Cambodia is rice. And we were told that a lot of it goes to China. This is more typical of the way people live in Cambodia. All through the countryside, you see these little villages uh, with houses elevated on stilts. Uh, of course, they have an extremely rainy, wet season, so I'm sure this gets very swampy underneath. Uh, but also their livestock is just roaming underneath. A lot of chickens, uh, some pigs uh, and, uh, you know, uh, dogs and so on, so that um, the people sleep up here uh, away from uh, their animals and uh, presumably where it's also drier during the rainy season. These are all tarps. And what you see uh, in all these places is tarps with rice uh, drying and then being bagged up for shipment, as you see here. It seems like villages are uh, almost like communes because uh, all of these uh, bags of rice will just get loaded all together. So I have a feeling it may not be individual families who are selling these, but it might be a communal effort. When you, when you look at all the rice out in front of all these homes, I don't know how they would keep straight who's is who's, so. Mm -hmm. I assume it's communal, yeah. Ville Cruz uh, was the only place where we were in tents. Um, we went there particularly just to see two species of vultures. So here are our six tents in the middle of some place. We have no idea where we were except somewhere in, in northern Cambodia. Um, here, here's our tent, two cots inside, uh, good screens, fortunately. Uh, no, uh, our water is just bottled water. Uh, no. No, there was a there was a little bathhouse. There was. Oh, really? You didn't. You didn't do it. I did. I didn't do it. No. There was a <laughs> bathhouse. Yes. <laughs> Were we on the same trip? And these three women um, did really a rather remarkable job of feeding us uh, while we were out there, just with you know everything that they had to carry and with them. So I should say a bath tent. A bath tent. No, no, I wasn't doing that. The nice thing about being a male is you just can use the woods for something. Not that you couldn't. But our goal was to see these vultures and. The white rumped vultures, which you see on the left, are very common, uh, but the red-headed vulture is a rarity, uh, which uh, a couple of them eventually arrived. Now, uh, to, to get to the vultures, we walked, I would guess, about two miles from the tents through the forest uh, to uh, a... In the dark in the morning. <laughs> well, you had to go early. Um, to a... Um, blind that was made out of cement, uh, like a cement wall. You could sit behind the wall and look out through these apertures at the vultures, because the vultures are very shy. If they see a human, they fly off, presumably. So we, we got there very early in the morning before the vultures and before the sun <laughs> and waited for them to come. And uh, we probably were, I guess, 100 yards, maybe something like that away from this dead cow, which was a grateful distance to be. And uh, the vultures came in, as you can see. Uh, and the rarest vulture of all is the slender bill vulture, which is this guy. Uh, and we only saw the one slender bill vulture. I have no idea, you know, how abundant or widespread the bird is, but uh, it, it was, we were told it was an extremely rare species. And in order to see these vultures, they had to slaughter a cow for us. So you have to, 
there's a certain fee involved with going out and doing this viewing and part of your fee is sacrificing yeah. a cow. Paying for the cow, um, nothing too good for us tourists. <sighs> yeah, didn't really know that ahead of time. Yeah, <laughs> that was kind of ex post facto. So uh, one bonus was a very near our tents. Uh, here's this bird uh, cryptically concealed in the uh, leaf litter and underneath her uh, two eggs. So this is a long tailed night jar, a nice bonus uh, to discover this bird nearby. Well, now we're crossing uh, the country and uh, the Mekong River, which you can see is a very large, wide river. Quite, a lot of it's quite shallow, but it's very wide. Uh, and uh, keeping in mind it's the dry season, uh, and in other times of the year, these islands are underwater. Um, one of the, and we, we took a ferry across the Mekong River, uh, but we also went out into the river in, in small boats with the idea of finding a uh, wagtail that is a bird that lives only on these islands and as far as you have noticed, nowhere else. It's, a, it's a, uh, a Mekong River bird endemic that lives only on islands in the river. And presumably some of them are not above uh, low water all the time. And this is the only picture we got. We got, we're in a boat the boat's rocking and we're close uh, we're close to one of these little islands and there's the bird so it's not centered uh, but uh, other pictures we had were so uh, just too blurry so as we went further east we uh, went to some other uh, areas where the grasslands uh, were not rice fields these are natural grasslands and our main quarry was a large bird called the Bengal Florican, which I think is a really neat name for a bird. We walked for many, many miles across several of these fields. Uh, here's one striated grass bird, which is a, actually a pretty widespread bird. And the Oriental Pratt and Cole, uh, another widespread bird of wetlands in um, Asia. We were fortunate to see Sarah's cranes. You see her on the left. And finally, at, at a great distance. Great a, distance. <laughs> a great distance. <laughs> I would guess this bird is more than a quarter of a mile away. And Chris was able to get this one shot of a Bengal florican male, um, which is a type of bustard. If you're familiar with um, bustards are related to cranes, a kind of old world cranes and uh, some of you who are birders know about bustards. So this is, uh, all the bustards are large grassland birds and this Bengal florican is very spectacular when it flies because the wings are pure white. So you get this black neck thing with white wings and uh, pretty impressive when it flies but you never could get close to one. You are lucky to see one and get a picture. In fact, this was the second try at it. Yeah. And finally, we spent a few days in the eastern hills near the Vietnam border. Uh, this was a region, um, you may have met, remember that when I showed the, uh, the map of the country at the beginning up in the northeast, there were some rather sizable mountains. Uh, these are the foothills of those mountains, uh, quite near Vietnam. Uh, and this is an area that we were told still had wild elephants, a few tigers, and uh, sun bears. Uh, so it's a little corner of uh, Cambodia that is still quite wild. And there was illegal logging going on there, by the way, which we also uh, saw. Uh, but some really spectacular birds, as you typically have in tropical wet forest environments, such as this fire-breasted flower pecker, this really wonderfully uh, colored orange-breasted trogon. Uh, if you're familiar with trogons in Central and South America, they're usually mostly green or, or, or dark purple, uh, but this thing was a really a weird uh, a rufous color. I thought really beautiful bird. And then the great hornbill in flight, 
uh, hornbills are very large relatives of our woodpeckers, you know, found only in Southeast Asia. Which and we kept hearing and hearing, and then finally it showed itself. Flew, yeah. yeah. And, and in Africa, you know, this is in hornbills in Africa. We stalked and finally got a glimpse of the green peafowl, a different species from the peacock, a close relative. <laughs> and we're only able to see it through a screen of vegetation, as you can see there. And, uh, Show its that, head. In yeah, it's just hard to see its head right there. Um, but we, we could hear this bird. It was very vocal, but to, to see it was very difficult. And uh, uh, on the other hand, this bird was easy to see, the pocket rocket. Now this is a falcon that is the size of a house sparrow. It was uh, the world's smallest falcon. And it's called a pocket rocket because it is, uh, it would fit in your pocket and it is incredibly fast. This thing took off and flew like an arrow. Uh, really, really an amazing little bird. And then here the uh, black browed barbet. Uh, one of uh, many species of barbets that we saw during the uh, during the trip. Toward the end here, a, a little historical note. Some of you may be aware that Cambodia has a very tragic history that after not only uh, uh, being uh, bombed uh, somewhat uh, by uh, mostly by American forces actually in the uh, Vietnam War, uh, because the uh, North Vietnamese were using Cambodia as a uh, conduit for uh, troops moving and so on. So Cambodia, uh, Eastern Cambodia was bombed and then uh, after the Vietnam War ended, the Khmer Rouge took over the country. Uh, Pol Pot, uh, infamous as the leader of that group, and over a period of about four to five years, uh, there was a tremendous genocide uh, of Cambodian people. Uh, particularly people who now would be in their 70s. Um, so it's a generation of young students and young professionals uh, that were, uh, many of whom died. Uh, they estimated 25% of the population. Uh, and uh, we could tell uh, that today in the sense that when we went through Cambodia, there you just did not see elderly people. Uh, people who looked as if they were 65 to 80 years old. It's like there was a whole missing generation. It was unusual uh, to see old, older people there. And uh, it turned out that the Vietnamese came uh, and uh, helped uh, overthrow Pol Pot and get rid of him in 1979. And a, uh, this big obelisk uh, in the eastern part of the country, right on a highway side, uh, was built to honor the Vietnamese, to thank the Vietnamese uh, for getting rid of Pol Pot. Uh, even though today there's actually a fair amount of tension between the Cambodians and the Vietnamese, uh, but uh, this, this uh, obelisk, just the same, is an interesting uh, historical marker. And another thing, uh, we mentioned that this is a Buddhist country now, and uh, even the most humble small towns would have a very ornate and beautiful Buddhist temple uh, nearby. And so uh, it's obvious that a great deal of the, of the wealth um, is, goes into uh, these places of worship and shrines. Many of these are shrines. <coughs> Many people are buried in these areas uh, of the grounds of these temples. These are very beautiful. And uh, unique places. Look at the colors, a very typical kind of roofing that you associate with East Asian culture. And one last bird. On the way back to uh, on the way to Nam Ten, which was our exit point for home, uh, we stopped at the roadside on the outskirts of this city of two and a quarter million people and found a Cambodian tailor bird, uh, which was only discovered in 2013. And uh, what's kind of strange about that is that this, this was an unknown bird uh, in plain sight 
uh, because it lives in, in kind of overgrown thickety places in and around Phnom Penh uh, and elsewhere along the Mekong River, which flows through Phnom Penh. Um, so it, it isn't really that rare but it, where it occurs, but it has a very restricted range. Uh, but it, it's right in the city, but it took until 2013 uh, for somebody to notice it and, and describe it. And we were fortunate to see that. And then uh, the next morning, depart for home. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, th this was different. Uh, <laughs> I want to say fun. Uh, but uh, if, if there are any